Hi, everybody, and welcome. I guess we'll get started. Um, we're thrilled and delighted to welcome you guys here today. I'm Dr. Laura Lieberman. I'm director of the Office of Faculty Development, and we've created this student seminar series um, to share uh, the work that our, our doctors and scientists do with students in the area to communicate the excitement of cancer research, to sort of build a community of students and staff at MSK, and to let you guys know about opportunities for students at MSK and in the tri-state area. So um, we're going to try to accomplish all of those things. Um, so we're going to have these seminars four times a year during the school year. Um, so there will be two in the fall and two in the winter, spring. Um, we have an external, uh, on the external website, if you Google MSK or MSKCC and type in student seminars, you'll find us. We'll post the dates of the upcoming seminars. And we'll also post links to other opportunities for volunteering or for doing research um, that I think might interest you guys. So just to get a sense of who's in the room, um, how many of you are students? Yay. How many of you are in high school? Okay. How many of you are in college? How many of you are after college? How many of you just kind of came in for the pizza? <laughs> okay. How many of you have a friend or relative who works at MSK? Woo! Okay, great. Well, all of you are part of our family, those who have someone who works here and, and those who do not. Um, and we're really delighted to have you here today. So um, the next student seminar is going to be in the fall. It's October 16th, which is a Tuesday. Same place, same time. And it's going to be on ethical issues in healthcare. care. Uh, Dr. Lewis Voigt is the head of our ethics committee, and he's going to moderate a discussion of the ethical and moral issues that come up when we take care of patients. Um, and that should be interesting. There are other opportunities, and we have a bunch of flyers out there which we encourage you to take. We'll also send you a survey afterwards by email. We'd love for you to give us your name and email address so that we can keep in touch with you and let you know about stuff that's going on. Um, and uh, Immigrant Health and Cancer Disparities has a lot of opportunities for students. They take students in high school, uh, in college on a rolling basis. Um, and there are other high school and college programs. So if you just Google MSK or MSKCC, if you type in student seminars, you get the student seminars. If you type in immigrant health, you'll get information about immigrant health. And if you type in high school and college programs, you'll get that info too. And we're trying to consolidate a lot of the links for you in one place. We actually have a sheet. I know paper is old fashioned and not very green, but um, this yellow sheet has a whole bunch of links with uh, opportunities at MSK and in the tri-institutional community at Cornell and Rockefeller and also at the Hospital for Special Surgery. For folks who are looking for summer opportunities, the best time to investigate that is in the fall. A lot of the uh, programs have applications that are due in around January. So if you want a gig at MSK for summer 2019, the time to start looking is the fall, and hopefully you will have applied by January. So just to keep that timeline in mind. Uh, and one of the upcoming uh, events that we have is called Major Trends in Modern Cancer Research. Um, and that's a talk that's open to high school and college students. It's moderated by Dr. Craig Thompson, who's the president and chief executive officer of MSK. And they get some great speakers who are going to talk about very current issues um, in cancer. And you're all invited to come. It's Tuesday, November 7. So um, today we're talking about a very exciting topic. Uh, we are all blessed with, we are blessed with an immune system whose job it is to protect us from foreign invaders. Infections, for example, are foreign invaders, and your body can recognize them as foreign and attack them. Wouldn't it be great if your body could recognize cancer as foreign and attack the cancer? It seems like that would be possible because cancer really isn't part of you. It's foreign. It isn't supposed to be there. But cancer is also kind of part of you, kind of self. So is there a way we can teach the immune system or help the immune system identify cancer as foreign and attack it? And this has been a very exciting area of research um, that uh, is ongoing uh, at many institutions and here at MSK. And we are lucky to have um, a wonderful scientist, doctor, and teacher who's going to talk to us about it tonight, Dr. Mike Postow, who is on the Melanoma and Immunotherapeutics Service at MSK. 
Um, he went to medical school at NYU, did his residency at Harvard, came to MSK for his medical oncology fellowship, and we were fortunate to get him to stay. Um, and today, he's going to talk to us about manipulating the immune system to control cancer. So without further ado, here is Dr. Postow. Well, thank you very much, Laura. This is great to speak with you guys, and it's always so much fun to talk to young scientists, high school students, college students, and people, I think that from our perspective, we're just really getting started with this story about how the immune system can be used to treat cancer patients. And in all of your careers, whether you wanna go on to a career in medicine or some type of science research, you'll be the ones that are really seeing this forward. And I think we have a lot of gratitude for you to really push this forward. And, and I hope today's talk, which is mostly conceptual, just to get you excited about this topic and to start thinking about some of these issues, will really be a stimulus to carry on as, as you go forward in your careers in science or research or medicine or any kind of aspect of healthcare delivery. So please feel free. We're gonna have, I think we have an hour for the whole conversation, but I don't plan on talking for a whole hour. So if there's something that's just really, really exciting during my talk, you can just raise your hand and I'll try my best to call on you and we can kind of talk through it or we can save questions for the end depending on how things are going. So I like to try to keep this informal it's a big honor to be able to work here at Sloan Kettering, and I'm, I'm very grateful for all my mentors and other people that have given the opportunities we have to do the kind of research that we're doing today. So we'll be talking about how can our own immune system in our body that kills viruses and kills bacteria, how can that be used to kill cancer? These are some disclosures that I have. So these are some, from some work that I do with some pharmaceutical companies in their drug development. When we think about cancer, many of us have biology class, right? So anyone been through ninth grade biology? Is it still ninth grade? Yeah, all the hands up, right? So you remember mitosis? Yeah, okay, good. All right, we won't tell your science teachers if you didn't say yes, but essentially, we used to think of cancer, and in many ways, we still think of cancer as a disorder of dividing cells, right? So you have a cell, and when one cell becomes two cells, it goes through mitosis. Right, so if you remember that, the DNA is synthesized and then it goes to the, you know, all the different M phase of all the different kinds of things that happen with the um, chromosomes and they separate. Remember all this? So you should know this better than I do. But the bottom line is a normal cell goes through cell division and it goes into two cells and then two cells become four cells and you know, it just keeps basically normal cells divide. And a cell will normally go through division when it receives appropriate signals to say time to grow or time to divide. And that's generally what normally happens in cell division or cell growth. Now, when cells are doing this, they make mistakes sometimes. So the DNA might not be exactly replicated perfectly. And a lot of times the cell will recognize and say, oops, I messed up. I shouldn't keep dividing myself because I'm a mistaken cell. And it will normally undergo a process called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, where a cell says, I'm a bad cell. You should get rid of me. You don't want me to keep growing and dividing and, and, and causing more clones of myself when I made a mistake. So we traditionally thought of cancer as a problem of dividing cells and that this is kind of a, a traditional view of what we thought about for cancer, which is you have a cell that has a mistake in it and it doesn't really know that it messed up for itself. And instead of saying I made a mistake, I'm not gonna keep dividing, it will just keep dividing and one bad cell will become two bad cells and two will become four and four, eight, and it just keeps propagating like that until we have too many bad cells that not only grow into a tumor, but also have ways of migrating around through the body and setting up shops in places where we don't want them to be, like in other organs, and that's when we have patients with metastatic cancer, cancer cells that have moved from one place to the other, and those are people that need the care of medical oncologists to treat them with treatments that go through the whole body. And when we think about this, and we think about this is a problem of cell division, that's a historical way that we always thought about cancer as being a problem of too many cells that were genetically aberrant dividing too much. Maybe there was something that they didn't respond to the normal growth signals appropriately and they divided too much. Maybe it was a problem just too much kind of mitotic activity when there shouldn't be. So a lot of the standard chemotherapies that have been really successful in many contexts in cancer treatment were developed to try to block this process of aberrant cell division. 
And chemotherapy has been very successful in many diseases, helping cure patients with cancer. Certain kinds of testicular cancer are cured with chemotherapy drugs by blocking this process of cell division when it shouldn't be happening. Unfortunately, we know that chemotherapy also blocks normal cells from dividing too, and that's why people lose their hair with some types of chemotherapy because it blocks the way that the hair follicles repopulate hair. So there are side effects of chemotherapy, and we're always trying to come up with a new way of treating patients with cancer. So what's that, and where does immune therapy fit into this? So we know that cells look different when they're cancerous cells because they're usually dividing too much. But cancer cells also look a little bit different than normal tissue cells in the body, and they can be recognized by cells of the immune system. This is shown here, a cytotoxic T cell. So has everyone had immunology? Do you guys do this in high school? A few people? College a little bit? Good. So I know immunology, when I first learned it, I hated it because it was a lot of letters and numbers and didn't really make a lot of sense. And I'll try, if anything, I can try to get you to pay attention a little bit better in immun immunology class because it's relevant to what we do every single day. This is a cancer cell that's getting destroyed by a cytotoxic T cell, showing basically that T cells of the body that are patrolling through the body to make sure there's no foreign invaders can see a cancer cell as different and destroy it. And this is a whole different mindset of using the immune system to treat cancer than the traditional view of chemo, which kills the dividing cells as we talked about previously. So what do we really know about immune therapy and what do we really know? It doesn't quite look like that. That was a real zoomed in picture of a T cell destroying a cancer cell. This is kind of what it looks like under the microscope. You have a tumor here, and this is a histologic slide, which just means you take a tumor and you look, slice it up and you look at it under microscope. You can see on the top here, there's a lot of weird, funny looking cells, cells undergoing mitosis, and all these little dark little spots here. These are all different kinds of lymphocytes, of which T cells are one kind of lymphocyte. Lymphocytes infiltrating into a tumor cell. So as I showed you on the prior slide, lymphocytes recognizing these cancer cells and killing them, this is what it actually really looks like under a microscope. So how do we really think about immune therapy? Well, if we think about this, this is really cool and really exciting now in 2018, but this story began in 1891. It's the same, around the same time that another story began. Does anyone know who this is? James For Naismith. James Naismith, that's right, exactly, from the back, which is wonderful, right. Anyway, so if you guys like basketball, I know it's... MSK represent. Okay, wonderful. So James Naismith is shown here in 1891, and this is his famous peach basket. I know it's the time of the NBA playoffs and everything like that right now. So James Naismith was inventing basketball in 1891, throwing these little balls into peach baskets right around the same time that this surgeon was working at Sloan Kettering. Does, now does anyone know who he is? This is extra credit. <laughs> right. Okay, this is William Coley. He was a bone and sarcoma surgeon. Sarcomas are tumors that come from the muscles and bones. And he was a surgeon this, uh, that worked at Sloan Kettering. It wasn't called Sloan Kettering at the time. There, there are different names, but if you look at the time of this picture, if you look down at the bottom, this is, is actually 1892, but pretty much close enough, 1892. And if you look here, it's cut off a little bit, but it says Xmas Party 1892. So this is a picture from the Christmas party here at Sloan Kettering in 1892. We have more fun at our holiday parties than it looks like they were having back then. <laughs> but they were very serious, right? So they were thinking about immune therapy. And this was one of the first people that really decided that the immune system could be used to treat cancer. It's actually interesting. RNC Hospital, this is the hospital for the ruptured and crippled. So it's also good we changed our name from 1892 because this is not a very good name for a hospital to have. But essentially, this guy here, William Coley, noticed in the patients that he operated upon that had post-operative infections. So when you do surgery on patients, you have to be really careful to maintain very clear antibacterial activities. You put special gowns and gloves on. Many of us have observed surgeries. You have to be very careful because when patients have open wounds, they can be really at risk of picking up bacterial infections, among other things. But this gentleman noticed that when I operated on patients and they had an infection after surgery, sometimes those patients would have bad fevers and chills, and it was very big problem right around the turn of the century then when you had an infection, but some of those patients had spontaneous regression of their tumor. So he was one of the first to hypothesize that if the patient's immune system could be revved up in this context right after a surgical infection would happen, then tumors would spontaneously regress. And this is a picture of a man with a big tumor on his neck here that came from one of his earliest papers 
one of these kinds of patients that had these amazing responses when these patients had post-operative infections. And it wasn't really a justification for giving people infections to try to get their tumors to go away because their immune system will get revved up, but they tried to purify some of the materials that actually would cause these tumors to regress, and this material was called Coley's toxins or Coley's vaccine. And whether you called it Coley's toxin or Coley's vaccine was related to whether you were a big fan of this kind of approach and you'd call it Coley's vaccine, or if you were kind of against him, it was called Coley's toxins because patients had fevers and a lot of immune activation, which was obviously life-threatening in a lot of contexts. It was a very controversial kind of treatment right around the end of the 1800s, 1900s. But that kind of thinking is really what led to this big immune therapy revolution that we're really having right now. So what's going on right now? Does anyone know who this is? Yeah, ex-President Carter. Anyone alive when President Carter was president? A couple people, all right, okay. We won't ask how old you were at the time, but this is ex-president Jimmy Carter, a big story that came about called New Immune Therapy Drug Behind Jimmy Carter's Cancer Cure. So he had an, an immune therapy drug for his advanced melanoma, his melanoma involved his liver and brain, and actually it was a combination of immune therapy, radiation, and surgery to get him in his good kind of spot. But obviously the, the media is very excited about immune therapy, so they picked this up as just a pure immune therapy story. But the bottom line is he's done very well with his metastatic melanoma, and everyone's very excited about some of the drugs that are out there that really resulted in amazing responses in people that, like Jimmy Carter, who's over 90 years old, that had melanoma that had spread in the liver and, and brain, which is a, a serious situation when you have melanoma in those places. So he's done very well. The news media loves this kind of stuff. It was in the New York Times. This was an article from 2016. 2016, kind of the, the spring and fall of 2016, it was a presidential election. It was like, you know, every time you open the newspaper, there's something about the election. So it's, it's actually a big deal that right here in the center of the New York Times, in this article here from the summer of 2016, was an exam room at Sloan Kettering here, a sickened body as a cancer weapon, harnessing the power of the immune system to treat cancer. So, you know, even something more important that summer, uh, Donald Trump made it onto a, a side column, so of course there had to be something there. But just to show you, immune therapy is taking over even the biggest news stories. So this is a big deal all around. Has cancer finally met its match? It's all over all kinds of different media outlets. Glad that made the front cover here instead of what's wrong with hospital food at the top. <laughs> so I'm glad they had the priority straight. But this is just to show, this is all over the media now. This started over 100 years ago, as I described, and this is a big deal right now. So what's really how are we thinking about these immune therapy approaches and what are the opportunities for your future research and, and concepts of career development as you go through high school, college, and, and move on with your career? How can we use the immune system to treat cancer? What are we thinking about combinations of treatments and how do we deal with side effects? So if we go into medicine, no matter what field of medicine, even if it's not oncology, we'll probably be having to deal with this. So how do we think about immune therapy in general, basic kind of large picture construct? This is what a tumor looks like, not really, but kind of conceptually, okay? It's a ball of cells, but the ball of cells with a tumor comes from our normal healthy tissue. So tumors don't really come in from outside of our body. They come from normal healthy tissue, like normal lung tissue, normal colon tissue, normal melanoma cells or melanocytes, which can live in the skin. And when those cells are part of normal healthy tissue, the immune system, because they come from normal healthy tissue at one point, they look kind of like normal body tissue. And so this is what a tumor should look like to the body, but this is what the immune system might see. So if you, the immune system in the body is really good at not reacting against normal healthy tissue. We don't want it to react against normal healthy tissue or we have something called autoimmune disease. So the immune system doesn't really see normal healthy tissue and react against it in the normal ways. And these tumors can hide out inside normal healthy tissue because they come from normal healthy tissue. But what we need to know is, what are the specific aspects of a tumor that make it a little different so that the immune system can see that there is a tumor right here within this kind of sea of normal healthy tissue cells? And so if these tumors express different types of antigens, which is a kind of a part of a protein that it can show on its cell surface, then it can look foreign to the immune system. And this is what we want. We want tumors to look different from normal healthy tissue such that the immune system can be directed against it, like something that looks really different to us, like a bacterial inf infection or a, a cell that's infected with a virus. That looks really different. That shouldn't be in our body. So we want 
cancer cells to kind of look like this so that the T cells that are fighting these tumors, and I showed some cartoons of that, can get into the tumor microenvironment. Once they get into the microenvironment, they release a lot of substances. There's different kinds of substances, one called perforin that pokes holes in the tumor cells, and things called granzyme, which kind of help kill these tumor cells. And this is a cartoon showing these T cells in tumor microenvironments destroying these tumors that look different to the immune system than normal healthy tissue. So every step along the way here, from trying to make a tumor look different to normal healthy tissue, to getting T cells in the tumor microenvironment, to helping these T cells kill these tumors better, that's how we're manipulating the immune system to try to get this T cell attack better. So how are we doing that? How do we enhance each step along the way to try to make these tumors better at getting destroyed? How do we make these tumors more visible? There are a lot of different hypotheses and strategies to do this, and this is a very big active area of research. Some people believe that if you give patients vaccines in certain contexts, like different peptides or DNA vaccines that are resembling tumor antigens, that might be a way to wake up the immune system if there's something different there about a tumor. That's what's called like an exogenous vaccine, where you get a vaccine that's from the outside of the body. But some people believe we have the raw materials within the tumors themselves to auto-vaccinate ourselves, and we just need to find a way to get the tumors that are already within us to express more of these antigens. And so there's a lot of different strategies that are going on that are hypotheses that are trying to find ways that we can increase the antigenicity of these tumors so the immune system can see it better, including ways of injecting different viruses right into the tumor cells, and I'll show a picture of what that looks like. Some people believe that in mouse models, at least, if you radiate certain tumors, it will release more antigens. These tumor cells kind of explode and release different peptide fragments that say, I'm a tumor, I look different, come kill me. Some different kinds of normal targeted drugs that we use in oncology that target different kind of mutant proteins in cells can be effective at making these tumor cells look different. And even some forms of chemotherapy. We've traditionally thought of chemotherapy as killing dividing cells and making people immunosuppressed. Some kinds of chemotherapy, not in all contexts, but some kinds of chemotherapy can be immunostimulatory. So we have a lot of stuff to learn about still from that. And there was a big lung cancer trial that just came out that's been all over the news that combined immune therapy drugs with different chemotherapy drugs and showed that, that the outcomes are really good. So in that study, it really showed that adding immune therapy to chemo made chemo work better. So these are some of the things that we're doing in clinic to try to help make these tumors more immunogenic. This is a patient that had a melanoma lesion on the arm here. You can see this is kind of like on the back of the elbow. And what we do in clinic is inject, in some patients, not everyone, we inject a virus into the tumor. So this is someone getting a viral injection of a virus. It's actually a herpes virus that you inject into the tumor. And the idea is if that is, if you give the virus into the tumor, it makes these tumor cells more visible to the immune system. So here's a picture of uh, other melanomas being injected. And this is an ultrasound photo showing a needle going into a melanoma lesion and injecting this virus. The idea is if you give this virus, it can make the tumors look a little bit more funny to the immune system, and hopefully it can help other immune therapies work better. We have a study in melanoma where we showed that one of our immune therapy drugs efficacy was actually improved when patients also had this viral injection. Radiation has been another one that uh, has been of personal interest. It's not been proven yet in patients that this is really something that has been shown in clinical trials to be effective, but we've had some interesting cases where we've seen some curious findings. This is a patient that we took care of uh, with my mentor, Jed Walchok, who's also a doctor here. This patient had metastatic melanoma, and you can see where these arrows are pointing and these red circles are. That, that these are where some tumors were. You can see a lymph node here, this little gray spot in this tumor on this patient's back. And she, in 2009, had a melanoma recurrence and over time was treated with an immune therapy drug. But what you can see in some of these circled areas, this is a CAT scan here on the bottom. Right here, this is a tumor in the back. You see this little gray area? That was a tumor in the back that was growing. Over time, a year later on this immune therapy drug, there were some little dots that were starting to happen in the spleen, and this, these tumors were getting a little bit bigger, especially this one in the back that started to cause pain. And this patient didn't have a lot of treatment options at the time, and so the <laughs> immune therapy drug was continued for a while. She was feeling okay until the pain started getting worse in the back here, and ended up getting radiation to the specific area in the back where the tumor was causing most of the pain, and this is a radiation planning uh, color kind of coded scheme where showing how much radiation was given in the back there. 
After the radiation was given, the tumor still got a little bit worse, but over time what we saw is that tumors outside of the area that got radiation also started to improve. So this spleen, this is the red circle on the bottom, some of those little dots in the spleen just ultimately vanished, and the tumor in the back got much better that was radiated, and also this lymph node that was in the lung also got a little smaller. So the hypothesis from this one patient, which is not data really to make a clinical decision, but something just kind of curious and interesting, that maybe radiation could be something that could also make the immune system a little bit more awake and help other immune therapy drugs work a little bit better. There's a lot of lab experiments that show this in mice. We're still trying to do clinical trials to demonstrate this in patients. But the idea is if you combine different treatments that target the tumor, whether it's radiation or injecting these viruses, that might make the tumors more immunogenic and bring more T cells into the tumor so that they can do the killing there. So what happens to get more T cells into the tumor? We want to get more of these effectors in there. There's other ways that we try to do this by just bringing more T cells directly into patients without all these fancy approaches. And there's different kinds of treatments called adoptive cell therapy. And remembering all the different kinds of adoptive cell therapy, I think are, it's a little bit getting into the weeds on, on too many details, but it's basically adoptive cell where you adopt or you take on cells directly that are hoped to help fight cancer better. And there's different ways you can get these cells. You can either take them directly out of a tumor, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and I'll show you a cartoon of how that works. You could take them out of the peripheral blood, or you could take them out of the peripheral blood and engineer them in a laboratory to become special kind of fighting cells called chimeric antigen receptor T cells or CAR T cells. Has anyone heard about that, CAR T cells? So this is also FDA approved now for certain kinds of blood cancers like childhood leukemia. So what, are this, what does this look like in concept? This is, called, this is adoptive cell therapy, and this is a general way of doing this. Remember, adoptive cells, taking cells out of the body, treating them in a laboratory to make them better cancer-fighting cells, and then infusing them back into the patient. This is a patient, this is you know, not really what a patient looks like, but you get the idea. This is a patient that might have a tumor in the lung here, right? And the, little uh, blue circles are lymphocytes that are in a patient, and these lymphocytes often get into tumors, like I showed you with some of those cartoons. But for whatever reason, if the tumor's still there, these lymphocytes are not really effective at killing these tumors. And so what we want to do is make them better killer cells. So we can take out these tumors for some of these patients, and then what we do is we see that there are lymphocytes within the tumor, but because the tumor's still there and not often dead, the lymphocytes aren't killing the tumor well enough. So what we want to do is take these lymphocytes out of these tumors, treat them in the laboratory to make them better, cancer-fighting T cells or other kinds of immune cells. This is what they look like when you stain them in a certain way so you can directly see the lymphocytes. But basically what you do is you take the, the lymphocytes out of the patient, you have these T cells that are part of these tumors, and in a laboratory these T cells will populate and, and reproduce and, and hopefully grow. And so that what you can do is take them back out of the laboratory and use these T cells as a cancer-fighting army to then administer to patients with melanoma, and this is being tested for other cancers too to make the, the treatment go away. So this is a very exciting approach because it's using a living organism, like our own immune cell cells taken out of our body and kind of through this fancy laboratory process, administering them back to patients to try to get rid of their tumors. So, there's a lot of different ways that this can be done. This is what it might look like in the laboratory, and those of us that have worked in labs before and worked with different cell cultures and things, this is kind of what it looks like. And eventually the goal is to give these cells back to patients so that the T cells are better cancer-fighting cells can go back to patients and ultimately kind of result in tumor destruction. CAR T cells is another fancy way of doing this kind of concept, and this is what the CAR T cells look like in concept. There's different generations of them, and I think that's a little bit uh, details uh, uh, based on kind of how the T cells are stimulated in certain ways. But chimeric is a word that kind of means two different parts of something. And chimeric T cells are really where you take a part of an antibody, if you remember that from immunology, if those of you that have had that. You take a piece of an antibody, you take a piece of a T cell receptor, which is on the plasma membrane of T cells, you stick them together, and basically the antibody is really, really specific at recognizing certain targets that might be present on a tumor cell, and then that cell signal goes into the T cell through the T cell receptor, and hopefully the T cell will then be better at killing these tumor cells that express certain antigens. So this is one example, I would say, in broad picture concept of adoptive cell therapy. The last way that we get more T cells into tumors could be in concept something called bispecific antibodies. So this is kind of like a matchmaker, if you will. 
And what do bispecific antibodies do? An antibody is a protein that recognizes a very specific target. And what bispecific antibodies can do, because antibodies often have two prongs, right? So they'll have like a tree trunk with like two big branches sticking out. One of the branches can grab a certain kind of antigen on a tumor cell. The other branch can grab a certain type of an immune cell. And basically, it just brings them together. So it's a really fancy matchmaker between certain kinds of immune cells and certain tumor antigens so the T cells will be attracted to the tumor microenvironment better. And there are a lot of ongoing questions about what's the best immune cell to bring into the tumor microenvironment? Do we want to get rid of bad cells in the tumor microenvironment that are inhibiting immune responses? And what are the best antigens for this type of a treatment to work the best? So this is another way of bringing more T cells into the tumor in addition to this adoptive cell therapy where the cells go out of the body, you treat them in the lab, and then you give them back to patients. Let's say you've got the tumor cells in the tumor. The tumor looks different. All we need to do now is for these T cells to kill these tumors better. So how do we really make sure that happens? Because if that doesn't happen, it doesn't matter that you got the T cells in the tumor. You're not going to really get these tumors to be destroyed. So with each T cell, there's a lot of regulatory molecules on the T cell. If we think about our immune system, you want it to turn on when you want it to be on to kill a virus infected cell or to kill a bacteria or to kill cancer. But you don't want it to be turned on when you want it to be turned off or you'll have too much immune system activity. And so each T cell has a lot of different signals. You can see on the right side of that slide all the go signals on the T cell to tell it to, to work harder. On the other side of the T cell, you see a lot of different stop signals to tell the T cell, cool off, time to take a chill pill and relax. We don't want you fighting too hard. And these T cells are in this perfect equilibrium. And what we want to do is turn on the T cell at the right time and turn it off at the right time. And so when patients have cancer, we know that the T cells are not fighting hard enough. So one of the strategies that we have to help these T cells fight better is to block some of these negative signals on the T cell. And there's a couple of FDA approved targets that are already available for patients, mostly those that target the molecules at the top right there, CTLA-4 and, and PD-1. Those are the ones that are in the news the most these days. But we have a lot of clinical trials here at Sloan Kettering and other places that block other negative molecules on the right side of this T cell or stimulate other molecules that tell the T cells to fight more strongly on the left side of this scheme. So these are ways that we're fine tuning these T cells to make them better cancer fighting cells when they get into the tumor microenvironments. And this is a table that just shows how many different types of tumors that are being able to be targeted in this type of a way. And I, I think trying to know all the details is not so important, but just to know the same drug or the same way of turning on these T cells by turning off normal cell, normal inhibitory cells can be used to treat so many different kinds of cancer. So this is not really a cancer-specific treatment. This is a treatment just to make patients have a better immune system, and hopefully then their cancer will be killed. There are different targets. As I mentioned before, there's two that are FDA approved in this category of immune checkpoints. CTLA-4 and PD-1 are the most common ones. This is the most into the weeds we're going to get with immunology. So if you got this slide, don't worry. We're not going deeper than this. But if you remember T cells, how many of you guys have had immunology? Good. I promise I won't call on you, but that's really great background. T cells are activated by two signals. One, as I've been talking about a little bit, a T cell sees an antigenic peptide through the T cell receptor and sees there's something funny here. But if it doesn't get a second co-stimulatory signal, so it sees something funny there through the MHC presentation of an antigen to the T cell receptor, but until it gets that kind of pat on the back or you know, kick in the leg or whatever you want to call it of a secondary co-stimulatory signal, in this example, B7 and CD28, the T cell won't be activated. So when T cells are encountering antigens and getting excited and trying to recognize there's something to go react against, it needs two signals to move forward. CTLA-4, which is the one immune checkpoint inhibitor, that inhibits that kind of one step in the immune response so that it basically says, don't get too excited about this antigen here. Calm down. It's a way of kind of telling the T cells it's not time to get too excited just quite yet. So it inhibits, we believe, to a degree, that early stage of this T cell activation. CTLA-4 definitely has other functions that are more complex, like in tumor microenvironments, also to get rid of bad cells in the tumor microenvironment. So there's 
regulatory or immune suppressive cells in tumor microenvironments. And some people believe that blocking this molecule CTLA-4 works predominantly by getting rid of these bad cells in the tumor microenvironment called T regulatory cells. And that's not on the cartoon, but I think the point is that this is much more complex than I think we believe. PD-1 works a little bit differently. If you see these T cells going through the immune response here, you can see that the T cells leave lymphoid tissue like lymph nodes, go through the blood vessels, and then end up in tumor microenvironments here. And normally, when the T cells get into the tumor microenvironment, like I showed you in these cartoons, they kill the cells. But the tumors are pretty good at resisting them. And the tumors have these molecules on them called PDL1, which is PD ligand 1. So ligands bind receptors. So PD ligand 1 is like a sword that the tumor is sticking out that's basically saying, don't kill me, T cell, because you know, I'm going to stab you, basically. And the PD-1 is on the T cell. And when PD-L1 and PD-1 get together, the T cell is turned off and can't kill the tumor. So think about tumors as like little sea urchins that have these really, you know, lots of spines. And the T cells are trying to come in and try to kill these tumors. And like, you know, the T cell could get poked by trying to grab the, the tumor too hard because it's like the sea urchin with spines. So how do we make these T cells kill these tumors better? One of the ways that we can do that is by blocking these spines on the tumor with drugs that block PDL1. PDL1 is, is like that sword that's sticking out on the, on the tumor cell. Or we can help protect the T cells from getting killed by this PDL1 by blocking PD1. And that's what's shown in the bottom part of this slide. So either blo blocking the receptor or blocking the ligand can really be helpful in patients in helping improve their T cell ability to, to kill tumors, mostly in the tumor microenvironment. But again, PD1, PDL1, a lot more complicated than just in the tumor microenvironment. So how well does this work? This is a patient that was taken care of by one of my colleagues that had advanced melanoma. This is a big tumor. You see this under her left breast? It's a big, big tumor right there, right? So bad tumor that this patient had, very uncomfortable, painful, obviously. This was a CAT scan that was showing this tumor right here. This patient had one dose of a combination of these two immune therapy drugs that blocked both of these targets. Came back three weeks later for the second dose, and actually the tumor had completely disappeared. So it's really, really amazing. Now, this doesn't mean to say that we didn't have any problems at this point, because you can see there's a hole right here. So you, it makes you worried, you know, what if this was in a blood vessel or a bowel met or something like this? Could this cause a problem if there was a hole? But I think the bottom line is just to demonstrate how rapid and how powerful this treatment can be for patients when it does work well. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't work for everybody, and that's why I hope for you guys, as your careers develop, you can help us find ways to get this to work for more patients. One of the problems with this treatment, as one might think about, is the immune system gets so excited, it kills these cancer cells, like we just saw that tumor disappear, but it can also react against normal body healthy tissue, and we have to stop treatment. And these were some, this is what's called a swimmer's plot, basically. So if you think about each of these lanes here as like a swimmer if you're watching the Olympics, and the blue part of this line here, this is time the patients are on treatment, and each one of these lines is a different patient. The gold bar is when the patient stopped treatment and is just followed without any active immune therapy treatment. Don't worry about these circles. It just means basically the time the patients shrunk their tumors to a certain degree. But these triangles show that the patients that are followed for a certain amount of time are still in response, meaning their tumors have shrunk by at least 30% and there's no new tumors that have come. And so what we see here is that a lot of patients that stop these immune therapy drugs for side effects even just within a few months of getting started on treatment, so this is 16 weeks, so about four months, a lot of these patients that stop treatment early with immune therapy that have had a good response early on, their responses will be maintained a long time without ongoing treatment. Suggestive that we've done something special about these patients that's almost like a vaccination in some ways that they don't necessarily need ongoing treatment for a long period of time. They could just have this immune burst react against their cancer, and then they're protected long-term even without ongoing treatment. Now, unfortunately, there are some patients here that don't have this triangle, some of these bars that end without the triangle, and that means that there's been a new tumor that's come up. And so trying to understand, it's not everybody that has this persistent response. What is it about some tumors that become resistant to immune system attack? That's another active area of research that we're still going to be investigating. So what about side effects? If you think this is all about boosting the immune system, what kind of problems could one envision as we do this. So ideally, the tumor would be seen as foreign, and all the T cells would go to the tumor and kill it, like I said. But unfortunately, as we talked about, tumors come from normal healthy tissue, and sometimes healthy tissue and tumors look kind of alike, and the tumors are getting this immune 
reaction against them. But normal healthy tissue nearby also can be inflamed from these immune therapy drugs because tumors are hard to see. And what can happen when that happens? So I like to think of it as like a wrestling match, right? So we normally have a bad tumor. That's this big sumo wrestler here. And this is the immune system that's trying to push up against the tumor and trying to kind of destroy the tumor, but it's just not really working. So when patients have side effects, this equation gets flipped around a little bit, and the immune system actually gets so strong that it crushes the tumor, which is good, but we have to be careful because patients can have serious side effects too. And so trying to recognize these and understand why they're happening is, is really, really critical and important. So what do those look like? So this is just a cartoon that was drawn um, about different kinds of side effects patients can happen, that can happen. And when we were kind of thinking about what, what should we put together for this cartoon in terms of what are the most important side effects, basically this was a very easy cartoon to put together because I essentially just drew an arrow to every possible organ in the body, added the suffix itis to the end of it, which means inflammation, and said, this can happen to patients. And unfortunately, that's the case, that there's a lot of different side effects that can really affect any organ or any organ system in the body. You can have inflammation of brain tissue called encephalitis, the meninges, which is a layering and covering of the brain called meningitis, aseptic meningitis. Basically, any kind of organ system can be inflamed and involved. And I don't want to go through all the different side effects we see, but I'm going to highlight a couple key ones that might be part of ongoing research or something that might be a little bit interesting. You pick an organ, add itis, that's because the immune system is turned on too much from some of these drugs. Why does this happen? We don't really know. These are some conceptual different arguments people have made as, as terms of why are these side effects happening. In the middle, that's the famous tumor that we talked about, the tumor with the antigens. Doesn't really look like red triangles, but you can go with me on this. And these are the T cells that are killing the tumor. Some normal healthy tissue have antigens that look just like tumors. And this is a heart on the upper left. I, I hope you can recognize that. Um, but basically, these hearts have some antigens that look similar to tumor antigens in some context. And we found T cells that are reacting against tumor antigens actually in the hearts of patients that have had what's called myocarditis, which is inflammation of the muscle tissue of the heart. We also think that antibodies, so antibodies come from the B cell immune response, and these antibodies have been shown to be elevated in some patients that have high thyroid antibodies or low thyroid function because of antibody-mediated destruction. And a lot of different theories as, as why these things are happening. Some people believe that CTLA-4 expression, which is one of the targets of these drugs, actually happens on normal healthy tissue too, like pituitary glands. This has been shown in mouse models that the drug actually might even bind directly to the target in certain tissues and result in complement-mediated inflammation of certain organs. So that, lots of different mechanistic explanations of why these side effects are happening, and that might help us understand how to treat some of these side effects a little bit better. Right now, we just give patients steroids to suppress their immune system. I'm not sure that that's so elegant. In fact, I know that that's not so elegant. We need to do better about really why is this side effect happening and what can we specifically do to inhibit it. This is a picture of a heart muscle on the upper left, and you can see again all these T cells, these little kind of dark blue, brown, black little cells getting into the muscle of the heart, and this can be a life-threatening problem in some patients. This was a patient I took care of that had a bad skin reaction, so the skin can get really inflamed when you give these drugs. And this was a patient actually that had radiation treatment to his chest a few months before we gave him an immune therapy boosting drug. And you could see that the reaction on the chest was much more prominent than even other areas of the body. So certainly a pretty severe reaction. This patient was in the hospital having intravenous steroids because it was so severe. In melanoma, melanoma comes from cells called melanocytes that make skin pigmented. And so no surprise when your immune system is boosted against melanoma cells, those melanocytes that look kind of like melanoma cells can also be destroyed by the immune system. And this is a patient I took care of that had something called vitiligo. See this white area on her skin? That's because the normal melanocytes were being destroyed by the immune system just like the melanoma cells were. Some people actually think this might be related to efficacy of immune therapy drugs, at least in melanoma, with a PD-1 type immune therapy drug. And this can be a particular problem, especially in patients that have different skin tones. This is a patient um, an African-American patient that I took care of that had mucosal melanoma, and she had pretty severe vitiligo, as you can see here on her skin. How about diarrhea and colitis? My wife told me I had to put an emoji in this talk because I was talking to high school kids. So anyway, this is, sorry if this is too rudimentary for everyone, but <laughs> diarrhea and colitis is a big problem with these treatments too because the colon is an area that can have a lot of immune reactions. And we know about that from Crohn's disease and colitis and other things. And a lot of theories is why is the gut so effective with some of these treatments? And 
I don't think anyone completely knows, but one of the theories is that the gut has a lot of different kind of bacteria within it. And there have been studies that have been done that show that certain kinds of bacteria in the gut are actually associated with the likelihood of developing colitis. And this is something that was a study that was done by some colleagues here at Sloan Kettering where patient stool was collected and different bacteria in the stool were examined to try to see was there an association of certain kinds of bacteria in stool with the development of colitis or inflammation of the colon versus those patients that didn't have colitis. And the little bars here are just different colors of all kinds of different bacteria, basically showing that you can study stool in this way, look at how much bacteria, different kinds of bacteria are in the, in the gut in these patients and decide did they go on to develop colitis or progress to colitis on the right or were they free of colitis? And we found different kinds of bacteria. This one, bacteroidetes, was associated with a lack of colitis. So something protective. So maybe patients should have a pill that has this kind of bacteria, like a probiotic, or take certain kinds of treatments that manipulate the microbiology of the gut to try to reduce the incidence of colitis, hopefully help the efficacy of immune therapy work better. There's some studies that suggest that might be the case too, that you can manipulate this in certain types of way. But really to show us that human beings are living organisms, lots of bacteria, and lots of ways that the whole immune response is being modulated. So the future of immune therapy, as I'm closing here in the last couple minutes here, is understanding how we could get some of these responses that we've seen to help all of our patients. There's so much excitement about this and so much hype. I think one of the hardest things to tell patients, at least from my perspective, is when you come in and the immune therapy is just not really working at all. And having that conversation is really tough. And that's why we're trying to work on clinical trials and other different approaches to help more patients get the benefit that we can have. And we have so many different immune therapy strategies that are out there. I talked about those T cell modulati modulating targets. We talked about some of the different vaccines and virus injections. We talked about adoptive cell therapy. And I like to think of this as, as an artist's palette. So different kinds of colors on this palette that one might want to try to paint a particular patient a certain color. Not literally, but I think you got the idea. And what we need to try to understand is when is it appropriate to use a green color for a certain patient? When is it appropriate to use a, a blue color for other patients? And how do we mix and match these colors of these different treatments to try to help more patients? And if we're not careful, we could end up mixing a lot of different things together and creating a mess, like this little baby here. Uh, this might look like dinner time for some people, you know, with these little kids at home like this. But what we really want to do is have this elegant painting job, and that's for you guys to develop as you go through your careers. It's going to be really important to understand why do we give certain treatments to some patients and why others to other patients. And I think that hopefully there'll be a treatment for everyone eventually so that we can get to be more of an elegant painter than this little kid. I don't know if anyone remembers this painter, <laughs> Bob Ross. This is probably before your all time. So I'm dating myself a little, but um, you know, this is someone that I watched when I was a little kid of uh, painting these happy trees and other things and these beautiful landscapes. And this is what we want to get to. And this is what I hope you guys will become without the afro here. Um, <laughs> but essentially, that's how we want to be elegantly moving forward. So we need you to help us test these different immune therapies. Why they don't work would just be as important as why they are working. And then I think we think of ourselves as cancer doctors because we see patients with cancer. But as we give immune therapy drugs, we're actually not even directly treating cancer. All we're doing is boosting patients' immune systems in different ways. So all we are really are immune therapy manipulators. So what is so special about our role as a cancer doctor is you know, we need to really think about this in a multidisciplinary way because we need to work with rheumatologists who have lifetimes experience of dealing with autoimmune conditions and trying to understand at least side effects and how different manipulations of the immune therapy can be helpful for patients with cancer. So with that, I just want to close. I have some time, I think, for a few questions. This is our melanoma and immune therapy group, if it's a really Wonderful group of people. This is me hiding in the back, and Alex, our new guy, I always embarrass him in the front. He's not that new. He's about three years old now, but when we hire someone new on our service, then he'll be replaced out of the box, and we'll put them in the box. So thank you for your attention. I have a few minutes for questions. Thank you so much. We have time. We have time for some questions. I don't know if you want to take them. Or not. I'd ask if you can to go to the mic. We have a couple mics set up, and we also have some handheld mics, and we will come to you with the mic. Um, we're recording these sessions so that if you want to watch it again, you can watch it again, or you can tell your friends, and they can watch it. So we ask you to use the mic so folks can hear you on the recording. So um, does anybody have any questions? Yes, I think I saw a hand. Uh, let's take him first because he's right here, and then you. Um, is this being used 
clinically, generally, today? And if so, why is this not the only treatment being used today clinically? So very good question about what's happening in 2018 in April, right, with all these drugs and things. So in some diseases, immune therapy is the first treatment that we give patients, and it is FDA approved. So for example, the disease I see the most of is advanced melanoma. Usually when we see a patient with advanced melanoma, immune therapy is one of the first treatments that we think about giving patients. Some diseases, immune therapy is not as effective as standard chemotherapy or other proven treatments. And so in some disease settings, chemotherapy remains the first treatment that patients get, and immune therapy remains more experimental in those types of situations. So what are, are those kinds of situations? So breast cancer, for example. There are immune therapy tra treatments that are being investigated in clinical trials, but a lot of the strategies that I've been speaking about here today haven't yet matured to the point where they're the first treatment we give patients with breast cancer uh, uh, with standard treatment. It's more of an experimental clinical trial approach. So in some diseases, immune therapy has already shown better benefits than standard chemotherapy and other standard treatments, but not all diseases are, are, is the case so far. So it depends on exact specific scenarios. But right now, there are a lot of these drugs, like we talked about, are already FDA approved and in some contexts are being used as a first treatment for patients. So a lot of this is already ready for prime time, and every day there's something new that's coming out. For kidney cancer, there was just a new combination of these drugs approved just, I think, over the last month or so. So every month there's something new coming forward. Hopefully, eventually, this will be something that can help lots of different types of tumors because there's really no reason that one tumor type would be completely resistant to this approach, but we're just not quite there yet in April of 2018. So we encourage clinical trial participation so we can figure this out. Despite the side effects of this treatment, would you see immunotherapy as a type of preventative um, method to prevent cancer in patients who may be more likely to develop cancer or just, just healthy people in general? So a really good question about can this type of treatment, which most of my talk was around when the patient has an established tumor using these drugs to, to try to shrink the tumor, keep them from growing. What about preventing tumors from recurring in some patients that have had surgery to remove a tumor or even preventing tumors from happening in the first place. So the, the way drugs are usually developed is that you first test them in patients with established tumors and show efficacy. Then the next step where we've gone with this story is in some tumor types where patients have had surgery to remove a tumor, some of these drugs have actually been shown to be helpful in reducing the risk of those tumors from coming back. So it's not perfect. But for example, in melanoma, when a patient has melanoma involving a lymph node, like they may have a big lymph node in their armpit and they have surgery to remove that lymph node, some of these drugs have been shown to reduce the risk of the, that melanoma from recurring. So in some context, in certain types of risk profiles, these drugs can be used as, as risk-reducing strategies. We haven't gotten to the point yet where we're giving this to kind of normal, healthy people to prevent tumors from coming in the first place. I think we're a ways off from that. It would be wonderful if we could identify the patients that are likely to be extraordinarily high risk of developing cancer. And maybe in the future, clinical trials will be testing these, some of these drugs in certain ways for those kinds of patients, but we're not quite there yet. Thank you. Okay, one more, one more. Um, be, because a lot of people, um, around my age have developed food allergies and hyperactive immune systems. Do you think that means anything for cancer treatment? So it's a really good question. I don't really know. And that's a very important issue. If you have an overactive immune system already, are you more or less likely to benefit from one of these drugs? We don't really know. It's possible that there could be a hypersensitivity to these drugs, at least from an efficacy standpoint, but it's been hard to study this question. We've taken patients with autoimmune diseases, so not necessarily patients that have food allergies, but patients that their immune system is already overly active because it's reacting against their joints, like with rheumatoid arthritis, or reacting against their bowels with certain inflammatory bowel diseases. And we found those patients can also benefit from these drugs too. There may be more side effects in those patients because their immune system is already revved up, so they could be at higher, they, they're probably at higher risk of certain toxicities. But we don't really know about food allergies. That's an interesting question. So something you can study one day. No pressure. Yeah. 
So you've mentioned that immunotherapy works really well in some cases when it's hand in hand with chemotherapy, but for the future of it, do you see it um, completely eliminating surgical tumor removal, or do you think that doctors are still gonna resort to surgery first and maybe immunotherapy second as a kind of like follow-up treatment? So how do we think about surgery with some of these improved, what I call systemic treatments? So these, all these treatments I've been talking about go through the whole body. Surgery localizes right in the area that's being surgically removed. In some trials now, the standard way of taking care of a cancer would be you remove the tumor, and then you think about treatment afterwards for certain cancers. There's a lot of clinical trial activity going on right now, and clinical trials are still experiments, so it's trying to manipulate the current status quo, if you will. There's a lot of studies called neoadjuvant trials where we're giving this immune therapy or other kinds of treatments before surgery and trying to see what happens with the tumors as you go. So we give these drugs first. Instead of surgically operating and then doing treatment, giving the treatment and then doing surgery later. Right now, that still remains somewhat experimental, so we don't, at least with the immune therapy drugs, so we don't yet have a proven benefit in that situation, but more and more data keep coming forward. That is a reasonable approach in certain contexts. So one could conceive in the future, if we were so good at this immune therapy approach, which we're not quite yet, still we have a way to go to get to 100%. But if we get to that really, really high effective kind of treatment, we know more about the biology of each patient, how they can benefit, one could envision using this right away to treat patients to not only make the tumor that you were going to remove surgically disappear or, or get killed, but also to help protect against the microscopic disease that you don't really see when you do a surgery that actually ends up being the problem that patients have with their re disease recurrence. So hopefully this will eventually replace standard types of treatments, but we're not quite there yet, and surgery is always probably going to have a role in managing cancer patients. Um, what is being used in terms of awareness to make sure that this type of therapy is accessible to all cancer patients? So it's a very important point that at Sloan Kettering we're lucky because we're able to do a lot of the research and we have a lot of clinical trials here and so a lot of people that are working here are familiar with all this. But it's important that doctors and nurses and everyone, patients importantly, most importantly I think, know about all these advances and how do they know about them. And so I think we're still trying to work on disseminating the knowledge and research about this field out to different places all around the country and also importantly around the world. And we have a big problem still with inequality of care in different places around the world and access to some of these drugs and that's a whole big area of research and policy and how do we make one issue which I didn't really talk about today is cost. The cost of these drugs is exorbitantly expensive. And so one of the other big challenges in addition to the scientific ones that I, I was speaking about is how do we make all this affordable? Because some of the prices of this is exorbitant, and as, as this is expanding to so many different people, and more people are becoming aware of it, it's going to be impossible to pay for all this. And so hopefully over time we'll see some changes that can make this more palatable from an economic perspective too. But informing patients is helpful. The media is going crazy, so patients are like, it's interesting in my clinic when I mention some of these drugs now, patients will say, oh, I saw that on the news last week. And you know, it's interesting, because for years it required like a 30-minute explanation to tell people what this was all about. But now there's all kinds of stuff that's out there now. That with all that media and everything, there's a lot of misinformation and people saying all kinds of things that we need to undo in clinic. But through patient advocacy groups, websites, social media, all this kind of rapid fire viral stories these days, it, it's helping disseminate information. But as we see, there's a lot of stuff that can get twisted along the way, and so it's important to try to get the right message out to the right people, and then really figure out how do we execute the delivery of these treatments in a safe, cost-effective way, and, and we still don't have good answers for all that. And one more over here. Yeah. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, could you use T cells and antibodies of people who have already been through specific kinds of cancers um, and inject them into other people's immune systems so that they can use other people's immune system to recognize the cancer cells within them. So a good question about can you borrow a good immune system to treat a patient that might need it, right? So in concept, that's one of the thoughts behind bone marrow transplantation, which is a fancy form of immune therapy, especially something called allogeneic bone marrow transplantation, where certain blood cells from one patient are basically transferred to another patient with leukemia or certain kinds of lymphoma. That is a way of kind of taking one patient's immune system and helping another patient that needs it to fight off their leukemia. So 
It's probably the best example I have for that. It hasn't been something with solid tumors as clearly defined, but hopefully we'll figure this out a little bit better. One thing I'll tell you to go back to the, uh, the stool story, um, and sorry to keep reverting to that right around dinner time, but I think it's interesting. There's actually some studies of taking, so in, my, in mouse experiments, you can take, you could do what's like basically a stool transplant. You take stool from one organism and transplant it into another, and then the mice that had the bad stool to begin with can respond better to these immune therapy drugs. So that's opening up a whole area of clinical trials where you're taking stool from patients that have had good responses and actually transferring the stool to other patients that might not be as likely to respond to see if you can have that golden stool, if you will, to try to help more responders do better. <laughs> and this is actually used to treat infections. There's an infection called C. diff, Clostridium difficile. The stool transfer has actually been shown to be beneficial there. So there's kind of a, a history of doing this, at least for infectious diseases and hopefully for cancer too. So ideally, this idea that you have will be explored more as we move forward. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in the graph that you showed us, you said after they had the drugs that sometimes a new tumor would show up. But has there ever been a case where there was a mutation in the tumor that it actually fought back against the T cells? So a really good question, I think, to, to generally state your question is, why are new tumors coming up when someone's had a good immune response. What is it about what we call a, an escape lesion? So the immune response is so good, it destroys this tumor, maybe six months, a year, and then all of a sudden a new tumor pops up. Why did that happen? Is there a mutation in that tumor that makes it resistant to immune therapy? The answer is we don't really know. There have been a few studies that have been conducted on that resistant tissue that some people believe that one of the reasons it becomes resistant is that the way that those resistant tumors present antigens to the immune system is defective. So it's, you know, for whatever reason, the antigens in the first tumor that get killed, it goes away. The tumors find a way to grow without showing their antigens. So it's basically a way of hiding from the immune system and coming back over time. I would argue that there's different ways that we need to treat those types of tumors that are resistant in that kind of context. So Hopefully there's a way to kill those tumors. It just probably needs a different immune manipulation at that time. But yes, there have been mutations that have been seen in those resistant tumors that come much later, some of which affect the ability to present antigens to the immune system, and that's why maybe these tumors have come back later on. Thank you. Uh, hi, I've got a question. Um, I know you mentioned that one of the ways to better understand why these treatments work and don't work is to um, recruit conduct more clinical trials. So what efforts are being made to, I guess, to um, attract a diverse population of patients to actually go through these trials so we can get a better idea and a holistic view of what's really going on and how to, I guess, make, them, make these treatments better? It's a very important point. We need, since patients with cancer are a very diverse population, we need clinical trials to reflect the diversity of the patients that we treat. So we need to find ways to make sure there's awareness among lots of different communities, different geographic areas, different kind of parts of the country, different backgrounds, and all kinds of different things to get that kind of group of patients in our trials so we can test and really see if there's differences in different kinds of patient populations with some of the efficacy or safety of these drugs. And that is a very underexplored area of immune therapy research right now, and that is something that your generation of researchers can really be a big part of this story and, and really helping us try to figure out because we're just really so early with immune therapy efficacies and we're just taking the patients that we've had kind of so far, but this is just the beginning of a long story and that's a really important direction that we need to go. Thank you. Um, why does this immunotherapy work on only some patients but not others? <laughs> yeah, if I knew the answer to that, then... <laughs> I'd probably have a Nobel Prize. So uh, we don't know. There are a lot of theories. So what are a few of the theories of why it works in some people and not others? One thing that we've seen is that patients that have a lot of mutations in the tumor seem to be more likely to respond to immune therapy. So if you have a lot of mutations in the tumor, so mutations are changes in the DNA that produce different proteins that might be abnormal, that's one example. Patients have a lot of mutations in the tumor are more likely to respond to immune therapy. It doesn't mean if you don't have a lot of mutations, there's no chance of responding. It's just a likely 
a likelihood kind of, of how likely are you to respond. And so actually there's FDA approvals for certain kinds of patients that have a lot of mutations. It doesn't matter where your cancer came from. It could have come from your colon, could have come from your uterus, it could have come from you know, your gallbladder, wherever it was, wherever it came from, if you have a lot of mutations in the tumor and there's a lot of ways to look at how do you define that, those patients are eligible for getting these treatments by FDA approval because the responses in that group of people can be very high. So that's one theory. It's not the whole explanation because people with low numbers of mutations can still do very well, but that's one hypothesis. Other people think that tumors that have a lot of T cells in them already before treatment are the ones that are most likely to benefit from these treatments. I think it's likely a combination of all of the above. Some people believe that PDL1, remember I told you about that sea urchin with those spines sticking off, that PDL1 marker? Some studies have suggested that that PDL1 is associated with better outcomes with immune therapy too. Nothing is perfect. It's not a dichotomy. You will respond or you won't respond. Likely a constellation of all of the above is going to be incorporated in some kind of fancy model in the future that will give a likelihood of benefit. And hopefully, then we can understand, should this patient get one drug or a combination of drugs and which combination? That's another area that I hope you guys will help us figure out. Um, how does, um, what are the outcomes of immunotherapy on uh, children? Are they positive or negative or just the same? So a very good question with pediatric populations and immune therapies yes. and, and how it might compare to adults. And, Actually, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say I don't know the details. I'm a, an adult oncologist, so I don't have the latest on all the pediatric data at the moment. One would think that it should work in kids just like it does in adults. And so I know there's a lot of studies going on for pediatric patients with cancer to have a lot of these drugs. Some of them for sure have already shown benefits. So some of those CAR T cells, actually was, that was specifically developed for childhood leukemia. So we can certainly say it's beneficial there. So I think over time we'll try to know more about this. I don't have a lot in the way of specifics at the moment, but I would think kids would respond just the same. All right, thank you. I guess we'll take two more questions. Okay. Um, do you know if stem cell research has played um, a role in the like, effectiveness of immunotherapy? So stem cell research is a, a really kind of broad area of research and it's really a critical areas, a area of research. There's a lot of theories about stem cells and cancer stem cells and trying to understand as the stem cell matures into a differentiated kind of cell, you know, where along the way does it acquire certain immunologic characteristics. And so when we think about stem cell research, it's, it's often kind of a part of the whole immune therapy story, but it's not the, the kind of crux of it exactly. If you think about stem cell transplant in and of itself, as I was mentioning before, for certain leukemias, that's a form of adoptive cell immune therapy. So that kind of research around stem cell transplant has specifically been part of the immune therapy story, but other ways in terms of immunologically, I don't think we completely yet know about how stem cells can be harnessed to help improve the efficacy of our normal immune therapies, but that, that's something else that's in clinical trials. Thank you. So as you mentioned, you're aiding the immune system to fight against cancer. Do you suppose that any of the already developed immunotherapy tactics can be used for other diseases? So absolutely. If you remember one thing from this talk, nothing about what I talked about. All I talked about today was ways that you boost an immune system response. It just happens to work against cancer. And I think that's a, almost a fortuitous accident that it's amazing that the tumors are actually shrinking with this. So all this type of stuff, it just boosts an immune response. So one could hypothesize, and this is a hypothesis that's not been proven, that these patients that have had these immune therapies are more resistant against infectious diseases and certain viruses. That hasn't been proven, but that's a thought. What other diseases come from aberrant immune systems? We could be tweaking the immune system in different ways to help people with all kinds of different diseases far beyond cancer. And they may even involve some of these strategies that we've been talking about. So that's you know, really brilliant thinking for future areas of research to expand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Guys, I really want to thank you so thank you. much. We really appreciate your coming tonight. We're going to send you a survey uh, to get your views about it. If there are topics you'd like to hear about in future talks, we'd like to hear from you. We have a lot of information about opportunities here. We'd love to see you, talk to you, and we want to welcome you to our community. And thanks again to Dr. Postow for an incredible talk. Thank you, guys. <laughs>